It's five days since Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt won their places in the final round of the Tory leadership race. Unsurprisingly, most media attention has been focused on the former, with Johnson the clear favourite to become the next Prime Minister. So what have we learnt about him in the past few days? Well, one, he gets into screaming rows of his partner. In the words of Carrie Simmons, he doesn't care for anything because he's spoilt. Two, he's willing to send out surrogates to demonise people who call the police when they are concerned domestic violence is taking place, dangerous to say the least. And three, and what's become especially apparent today, he appears to be a compulsive liar. Now, we basically know this won't damage his standing among the Tory membership, but what about the public at large? In a populist age, could Boris's relaxed relationship to responsibility and truth actually work in his favour? To try and get my head around Britain's leading lying demagogue, I'm joined by Shelley Asquith, Labour activist and commentator. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And Labour MP Lloyd Russell Moyle. Uh, I'm lucky this evening because you're both... Uh, Involved in foreign policy in one way or another, you're one of the few, well, I think one of the few MPs in Westminster who really understands uh, British foreign policy. And Shelley Asquith, you are on the committee of Stop the War Coalition. So in the second half of the show, we're going to talk about uh, British arms exports to the Saudis and also the potential uh, lead to war in Iran. Or I mean, we'll talk about the extent to which, which that is the case. Anyway, rising tensions. Uh, but first of all, to Boris. Uh, so you would have had to have been living under a rock for the last few days to have not seen uh, the stories surrounding Boris Johnson's candidacy. But in case you were under a rock or if you live in a country, perhaps, where you have more important things to talk about, a quick run through of the weekend's events. So on Friday, police were called to the home of Boris Johnson's partner uh, in the early hours of the morning. Neighbours had heard a woman screaming, followed by slamming and banging, with Simmons heard telling, so Simmons is Boris's partner, telling Johnson to get off me and get out of my flat. After knocking to check if everything was okay, the neighbours called the cops, police turned up, spoke to Johnson and Simmons and said there was nothing of concern. The neighbours then passed a recording of the altercation to the Guardian. Simmons can be heard telling Johnson, you don't care for anything because you're spoilt, you have no care for money or anything. Uh, this created a weekend of headline news with Boris refusing to, to respond to any of this. Now, to me, this sounds more like a heated bust up than a case of, of domestic violence. Obviously, we'll never know unless there's, there's cameras inside that building. But it seems to me that from the evidence that, that we currently have, uh, there's nothing that would exclude someone from becoming prime minister in, in, in that particular event. I think what from what we do know, what's more shocking is the response to it. Um, so we're going to get up a tweet from James Cleverly. So I think Boris Johnson would have had an option of saying, look, uh, we had a bust up. It was unfortunate. I'm sorry that we created a disturbance to our neighbours. And it was absolutely correct that our civic minded neighbours called the police. If ever in doubt, you should call the police when mm. when there's a ruckus going on next door. But instead, what he tried to do uh, was encourage fundamentally uh, a media storm about the political motivations of his neighbours. James Cleverly there, I think you just saw the tweet, is is saying that they shouldn't even have called the police. Potentially the only reason they called the police is because they're Guardian readers. Um, and so a lot of people are saying this has potentially taken us a few steps back when it comes to, uh, as a society, taking seriously these kind of things when you hear, well, a couple mm -hmm. um, having a fracas. Well, well, how, how have you related or seen these events over the weekend with Boris Johnson and his partner, Carrie Simmons? I think you're right. I think we don't know what happened. I think the comment, get off me, though, is particularly alarming. And if I was in that situation as a neighbour, I would want to do something about that as well, no matter who it was that was engaged in that argument. But what is, as you said, you know, the likes of Cleverly, media figures as well, are pointing the finger at these neighbours and saying that they were wrong to do that, they were politically motivated. We know that witness accounts from neighbours or friends or other family members, whether that's involves making recordings of, or videos or audio recordings, whatever, that it is incredibly important in terms of evidence in making convictions for these cases. They, they are the kind of instance where the woman, you know, who is more often the, the uh, victim of domestic violence, domestic abuse, is so often not believed. So for these powerful figures to go around saying that they were wrong to do that, I think is very, very scary. Lloyd, do you think there's a risk in terms of uh, the left's response to this, I suppose, because I, I feel like when, when, who was it, Mark Field, when Mark Field was, mm. was strangling that woman and frog marching her out of the, of the, of the um, <coughs> yeah. what was it, the, the meeting in, in the city, 
Uh, and there were some journalists that were trying to make out that this was a cultural war issue and that it was actually lefties sort of like taking advantage of a situation. I felt in that situation, that was ridiculous. He was clear, clearly assaulting a, a peaceful protester. In this case, I feel like many of the public will see, well, it does seem like they were having a, a row in their home. And do you think potentially the left are getting taken down a rabbit hole by trying to make such a big deal out of it and people will see it as, as potentially opportunistic or cynical? Well, it depends how it's played out. I, I don't think saying that you should do your civic duty and call the police when something's happening is something that people will think is cynical. I yeah. mean, I know when I walk around the constituency, I see arguments happening and I often will um, stand by and watch to make sure that it is just a bust up. We all have bust ups, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually... I think it's reassuring to know there are other people around even when you're having a bust up because that can turn into something rather nasty as well. And I've intervened in the constituency in a number of times as well. Sometimes just because your no neighbours are being noisy doesn't mean that there's a bust up. But if your neighbours are having a full out argument, you don't need to think that it's domestic abuse. It could just be that you think that there are two people dist causing a disturbance. Actually the appropriate response is sometimes to call the police. So I don't think on any of those problems we should be worried. I think there is a worry if we try and make this the death knell of Boris's campaign. Because just like when people try to make the and far worse comment, of course, that Trump made around the, I grabbed them by the pussy, mm -hmm. you remember, that then did become a cultural war issue because people were trying to make that as the death knell of the campaign rather than saying this shows a pattern of behaviour of a person that maybe is not very good for office, which is, I think, what we need to talk about mm. and the response to that behaviour. Again, if Trump, uh, if you had focused on the Trumpian response rather than the, the comment, you might well have done better. So I think you're right. We need to make sure that we're not turning this into a... Uh, a, a kind of you've had an argument you can never win and I do remember when Gordon Brown was Prime Minister and lots of people conservatives and people who didn't like Brown you know and I campaigned to try and get McDonnell on the ballot to defeat Brown so I'm not I'm not I wasn't one of Brown's best kind of buddies in that sense politically but when people used to say he's got a short temper and um, sometimes shouts in Downing Street my response actually was well fine I, I don't want necessarily a prime minister who is lying down and peace and love you know that's <laughs> nice but that's not necessarily the only thing you want of a, as a prime minister and so I think we need to be careful not to try and um, demonize him for things that we all do sometimes do you think there's a reason though that so it, it was very clear so I've said he, he had two options one he could have and his surrogates come out and say look yeah there was a row it was good that the civic-minded neighbours called the police, but in this case, as the police have said, it, it was just a row. But instead, he sent them out to trash the neighbours and to say that them calling the police was politically motivated, to say them recording what they thought was abuse was Stasi-like. It was like something from the Eastern Bloc. So, so I feel like his people are trying to start a culture war. And... Of course. Yeah. Of, of course. The, the culture war as it were, it's not started by lefties. The cultural war of trying to reduce racism in America or the cultural war of trying to um, allow women to have rights to their reproductive rights and their bodies. These aren't cultural wars that suddenly the lefties have started. This is a long battle that progressives have been fighting for many decades. The cultural element of the war is that there is a small rump that know that they are losing this battle and they have started to change tactic and they're now like fighting as if they're in a corner and they're fighting dirty. It's always the right that starts the cultural war. That's how, it, that's how the cultural war works. And you see it in the US. It's also just a, a lesson in deflection as well though, isn't it? No, no longer are we talking about whether or not he is violent or abusive or aggressive or whatever to his partner. We're talking about the neighbours. And although you're right, Lord, to say that assessing this as a pattern of behaviour, because I remember years ago uh, there being a leaked recording of Boris Johnson in a telephone conversation. Do you remember this? And he was talking about planning to beat somebody up? Yes. Or something like that? No, he gave the number of... Like he was, a, he he was, was arranging how right. it would happen. Yeah. 
he gave he gave uh, the contact details of someone who someone else wanted to be beat up. Yeah, I think, yeah. Wasn't yeah. It? So, but I think it was so there were all of these conversation. What was what was going on, wasn't it? Yeah, there are all these issues of character, and people mm. are trying to bring in this question of character. But but he is a bit Teflon with it. I want to bring in phase two of their of their counter attack. So phase one. Uh, was to say, look at the neighbours, it's the neighbours, they're, they're politically motivated, they're the wrong ones here. Phase two uh, was to release a picture uh, purportedly yes. showing Boris Johnson and Carrie Simmons having a wonderful time in the countryside. In my so beautiful hopefully we can, county. Hopefully we can get that up now. Is that, now. Is that in your Sussex? county? Yeah, in Sussex. Um, they won't say where it's from though, when, when, when it was taken. Well, that's the oh, point. So okay. we're, we're also about to watch, I mean, hopefully we can get that up as well. Uh, Nick Ferrari this morning uh, was grilling Johnson because it turned out that this picture of, of, there we see it, we can see it up there, um, of Boris looking very happy with Carrie Simmons, uh, which they've said uh, just magically appeared in the newspapers. They're not, mm. they're not talking about how, why it was the case that there was a paparazzi positioned perfectly uh, in the bush to take this shot. Uh, and people, some sort of hair troopers, had al also noticed that Boris Johnson's hair, hair didn't troopers. look the same uh, in that picture as it currently does at the moment. So the theory emerged, which it seems is probably correct. This was a picture from a month ago or something, which they had released to, sh to purportedly show that, that him and Carrie Simmons were now getting along. So we can see Nick Ferrari now um, grilling Johnson on the provenance of this particular photo. <coughs> It was the decision of the of the uh, of, uh, it's up entirely when up was to newspapers taken? to decide what they want to print. When was it taken? Well, I don't get listen. You you are what? You so are, that's a state you're secret. Asking me, you're asking me. So Adele. that's a state secret when it's the picture was taken. Secret. So when was it taken? It's not a state secret. It just happens to be something that I don't want to get what? into. Because you won't even tell me when the picture was taken. No. Why should I? Because Why it's not I? recent. Is mm -hmm. it? Your hair, your hair in this photograph is not your hair currently, is it? If I, if I may say so, this conversation We've got is now 20... descending into... Well, I'll fast. be the judge of that. Thank it's you. It's currently the Nick Ferrari show. Currently. <laughs> no, well, might actually, I... If you come for this job, that might change as well. <laughs> Who knows? But if the ball were to come out of the back of the scrum, this is a quite an old picture, isn't it? Nick, I'm not going to comment well, I'm on telling... the... If, well, it's, it's before it, the haircut I, you had be, from it the would Turkish be, chap. It would be... It will, it will be. Well, I will know you're wrong about that because ah. I no longer have my hair. Unfortunately, I no longer have my hair cut by the Turkish chap. I have my hair cut very, very nice person called Kelly or possibly when were you tomorrow. When did you last have your hair cut? I didn't have to ask Kelly or tomorrow. It was quite recently, actually. Well, anyway, what three weeks, six weeks, eight weeks? Uh, well, this is this is beyond Let's Saturday. This is beyond Saturday. We we have a we have a we yeah, have and a that's fantastic. What we're coming to. We have a fantastic prospect before us. So we this is a, at least six weeks old. Uh, this picture. Mate, I'm not going to. I'm right, not going to comment on. on the on the Peter on the, on the antiquity. Can we get to the, the provenance, please, Mr. I'm not going to com comment I'm on the antiquity or the provenance of some photo that newspapers decide to put on their front pages. This. I mean, on one level, that's a stupid video that's kind of funny. On another, I mean, what it does demonstrate is the cavalier attitude that the Boris Johnson campaign has to truth. Uh, on yeah. Sunday, uh, the campaign had sort of confirmed that the picture was accurate and that it was from, from that day. Uh, two days later, he said, no, it wasn't at all. And obviously, this was very avoidable to Boris Johnson. If he is on speaking terms with Carrie Simmons, it would have been very easy to take a picture actually on Sunday of them together looking lovingly in each other's eyes. Potentially, they're not on those on, on speaking terms at the moment, but they just thought it was it was completely fine and normal to just release a photo from a few months ago and pretend it was from Sunday. Very avoidable. Um, before we comment on it, I'm going to go to actually um, our, our piece of evidence too, which is that Boris Johnson is 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 a um, compulsive liar with a very cavalier attitude to truth. So if we can get up this, this is Johnson Boris Johnson talking to Ross Kempsell on Talk Radio this morning. So this was straight after he spoke to. LBC, so he was on a bit of a roll. What do you do to relax? What do you do to switch off? Uh, I, I, well, I like to paint, um, or I make things. I like to... What do you make? I make... I have a thing where I make models of... I mean, when I was in like, well, Mayor of London, we build a beautiful... I make buses. You make models of buses. I make models of buses. See, they're going to be in Downing Street. So, so what I do? No, what I do make models of buses. But what I, I make is, I get, I get old, um, I don't know, wooden crates. Yeah. Right. And then I paint them. And they, uh, and they have two, two. Suppose it's a wine. It's a box that's been used to contain two, two wine bottles, right? Right. And it will have a, 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 a dividing thing. 
Yeah. And I turn it into a bus, and I, so I, p I put passengers. You really want to know this? You're making, you know the, you're making I mean, buses. I mean, yeah, you're I making paint, cardboard I, buses. I paint, no, okay, I that's paint, what you do to enjoy yourself. I paint, no, I paint no. the passengers. Boris Johnson, I suppose, I mean, we're going to talk about policy later, but when he's, when he's talking about Brexit or, or issues of, of politics, people say he's either a liar or a moron. In this instance, he's clearly both, because he's clearly <laughs> making up. I think you might have actually missed the question. The question he's asked is, what do you do to relax? And then he's made up this incredibly uh, sort of extravagant, elaborate story about these weird cardboard <laughs> buses that he makes. And you can see him looking into the distance as if he's telling a child a story like that he's, he's just completely made up. I mean, we are going to have a compulsive liar for Prime Minister, aren't we? Yeah, I feel a bit triggered by it because it reminds me of being in a really bad job interview. You know, when you're asked a question and you've got no idea, you can't think of an example of whatever it is. And you just make something up and you're like, oh no, now I'm, now I'm with it. I've got to carry on the lie. It is so, that is, you've put your finger on why I was feeling awkward as well. <laughs> it's that, been there. It's that kind of like, you're having to grapple with any kind of thing and you're putting lie on lie of trying and it starts as a kind of white lie of oh yeah well I I, I led that team and they say so what did that team do <laughs> oh well we oh, you can just see it can't you but maybe it is true and he'll tweet a picture of some of the model buses I'm, I bet he'll probably tweet a, some pictures he'll get one of his staffers will be, one of his staffers will be busy <laughs> painting tonight, yeah. model buses now on these paper cardboard boxes well it wasn't it was wine boxes wasn't it so wine he's boxes, saying he puts yeah. two wine boxes on, on top of each frame, other like, presumably bananas and but, had an argument with his girlfriend yeah yeah throw, throwing them around but yeah. I don't know I think people like him he's, he's literally spent his whole life focused on one thing and that's becoming Prime Minister so he probably doesn't have a life like he probably doesn't have anything that he does in his spare time so he does have, just have to make it up well he he's a bit of a womanizer right so well yeah you can't say that I mean he's, you? he's likes to sleep with women and get drunk and sort of self promote he, he could have said I like writing I find that's writing true. relaxing yeah because he's written a book Maybe he didn't write the book, I don't know. Or his columns. Well, he writes <laughs> columns. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or say I like, cycles? I like walking, I like going in the countryside, I like cycling, I like running, I like... I mean, there's so many things that I could have lied more convincingly <laughs> than him. <laughs> but maybe that's the point, right? He, it's it's funny, we all laughed, it's maybe charming. Mm. And we're he talking about people, him. Yeah, 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 quite. Well, I mean, yeah. who's the or other potentially he's a compulsive yeah. liar. Who's the other one? Who's the other one again? What Jer drugs Jeremy, does he do? It's Jeremy Hunt. Jeremy Hunt. And I, honestly, I kind of have to check mm. myself to yeah. think who that other one. So maybe it's a clever strategy of just kind of, I'm going to control the airwaves, mm -hmm. I'm going to control this debate. And when he gets in, it doesn't matter what the liberal and left chattering classes think, because he'll be there and destroying the country. There's a theory which some American political scientists came out with to try and deal with, I suppose, Donald Trump's mm -hmm. victory, where they said that actually lying can in itself be a positive thing for a political campaign. Because if your support base are people who are fed up with the system, they want to see people who break the rules, because by mm -hmm. breaking the rules you show you are authentic. And one of the ways to break the rules is to openly lie. So when it comes to politics, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to say things which, is, which seem ostensibly true, you know, mm -hmm. which seem like they, they could be true. Most people think that politicians are lying anyway, but then you get a politician who flamboyantly and openly lies, and to some degree that seems more honest than people who are lying but doing it more, mm -hmm. more subtly and more successfully. So, so to lie in itself can become a, a campaigning strategy. Is there something in the statement that Gove made during that referendum campaign where he said, we're, we're fed up with experts and is there something along that narrative that actually a lot of people who feel that the system is broken but they're told things are getting all much better they feel that actually life has got substantially worse but they're told that unemployment's at record lows actually don't believe what is truth anymore and so therefore they don't see that as a lie mm. they see what everyone else is telling them as lies because it doesn't correlate with their truth and this correlates with their truth just as much as the lies do and so actually they say well at least that man is not telling us the rubbish around our lives are better I don't know if there's something around that mm. anti, uh, anti what you were suggesting thing, yeah. but kind of uh, an establishment of experts and mm. truth and I think it's a fundamental challenging of what is truth 
It's kind of like a postmodern dystopian world. There is no truth. There is no absolute right or wrong. We'll move on to to his policy statements in, in a moment. <coughs> because that's, I suppose, what we should talk about. But first of all, <coughs> Lloyd, you're from a, you won your seat off the Tories in 2017, right? Yes. Um, so the next general election, you're going to be defending your seat, which was was it Tory for a while, or had it just? Uh, we recently? lost it in 2010. Okay. In 2015, we failed to gain it by 500 votes. So you and so I won it. Yeah. You know your constituency quite well. I hope to think. How <laughs> how attractive do you think the people of Brighton, Kemp Town, your Kemp Town? Yes, Kemp yeah. Town. Uh, will there's three Brightons, aren't they? But your Brighton, Kemp Town. Well, how attractive do you think they'll find the bumbling Boris show? I don't think they'll find him very attractive at all. I don't think he's very attractive to Brighton. Mm-hmm. Oh, because it's Liberal and Remain. Exactly. I mean, well, not just... I he mean, won London, though. Not just Remain. Yes, but he didn't win some of the core parts of London. He won because he managed to galvanise the outer bits of, mm. of London. The Boris Donut. Yeah, that donut. I, I don't think places like Brighton will be sold for him, but places close to Brighton, Worthing, is very interesting with polling and the result. It's almost becoming a three-way. It's three way between Brexit, us, and the Tories. Wow. 2015, UKIP was second. 2017, we were second. And the polling now, we're almost all on even Stevens. Some people are saying that will be one of Brexit's early seats. Lewis, the other way as well. You have some interesting things there where now you've got the Greens, Liberals, and Conservatives with Boris in contention. So you, I think as soon as you get out slightly mm. of the, the kind of the more metropolitan seats, you suddenly see where Boris is really attractive. And that's because mm. a lot of those people, I don't want to be too nasty about them, a lot of those people, I think, look in, because they are so close to these metropolitan seats, they look into an element and they go, why are these areas not forgotten and why are we forgotten? You know, they can only be 10 miles down the road, but poverty and um, not just absolute poverty but just kind of a feeling of cultural poverty mm. or you know kind neglect of and... neglect is quite high and so that's where I think Boris has a danger of cutting through mm. and you've seen that with some of his um, talks when he's going door knocking and you've seen him videoed and saying well we need to plow more money into uh, you know schooling we need to sort that schooling stuff out and so he will appeal to some of that uh, kind of one nation stuff which is quite dangerous for a Labour victory. So in the in the freeway between uh, Labour Brexit Party and the Conservatives, one of the big uh, determinants of how that will play out in the next general election will be how Boris Johnson, if he wins, which he's very likely to do. I really don't think we should uh, overemphasise the extent to which there is a real competition going on here because I think the Tories would like us to think that there is actually a competition going on because that would make it seem like Boris Johnson is under any kind of scrutiny <coughs> from his party and he's not. Uh, but it will be you know, his future, if he does enter Downing Street, will depend on to what degree he can successfully navigate Brexit. Uh, in the interviews he did this morning, he did uh, speak a little bit about policy and we did potentially learn something uh, from the interview with Ross Kempsell. So we're now going to look at the clip of him talking about what his Brexit plan really is. For three years, we've been sitting around, uh, wrapped in, in, in defeatism, telling the British public that they can't do this or that. It is pathetic. But it's going to take it more... It is absolutely it, pathetic. It's going to take more than positive energy. That's what no, your, your critics say. It's not, it's not just about bluster. It's not just about pos- positive energy. But What's we plan B? What we is plan B even, if it gets blocked? Don't forget, we haven't even really wanted to come out. That's the whole... That's the, the heart of the problem. What we've been doing is we've been creating our own incarcerate, our own prison. We've, we've, the, the backstop, the customs union, the, the single market are all basically designed to keep us in. So plan B yep. and C and D. Yep. Plan, plan B, we get the deal we want, the, the type I've described. Plan B is to get a, a standstill agreement, a GATT 24 paragraph 5B type agreement, if that, if the EU won't do that, hang on, hang on. If the EU won't do that, and we have to come out on WTO terms, then Plan C would be to get ready for that outcome, and obviously we're going to do that. 
and it's very, very important that we do. And the British people have had enough of being told that they're incapable of getting ready to do this. Actually, the preparations by March the 29th were, were, were pretty far advanced. Can, can, and, can and they you? Can be, and they can be okay. very far advanced. Okay, fine. By, by fine, October fine. the 31st. Okay, uh, accept that's the plan. Say they all gone. Great. Uh, so I don't want to focus on to what extent he sounds like a complete idiot when he's talking there. I want to look at what his what his concrete plan was. Uh, so looking at the transcript, you can you can make out what he's saying is plan A, B, and C, even though he's called it B, C, and D for some reason. So he says. So the quote is: So plan B and C and D. Plan B, we get the deal we want the type I've described. So that's not plan A. No, that is plan A. He's just mis. Well, he's, no, he's plan, a, plan A is Theresa May's plan that's failed. So you've already right. moved on to plan B as a country, no? And then he misspeaks later on to refer, gets all the muddled up. Oh, whatever they... Well, anyway, his first yeah. choice, because he doesn't want Theresa May's no. deal, yeah. is to get a deal of the type that he's which described. So which is the deal without the backstop. Can he get it? You're a Brexit nerd. Um, <laughs> well, he... To be fair, if he applied for an extension of the commission, um, uh, sorry, extension of the exit date... You've got a new commission, you've got a new parliament. I don't think you can rule anything out the table. However, he has ruled out extending. The new commission doesn't take place, take its seats until the 1st of November. So there is no one to negotiate a new deal until after the 1st of November. Unless he's going to ask for an extension, it is physically impossible, because they just constitutionally don't take their seats, mm. to negotiate a new deal before the this new exit date. So... If you put the two statements together, it is impossible. But I, I'm not going to say it's impossible for him to get the deal that he wants um, with a new commission. I think it would be highly unlikely, and I can not imagine Ireland suddenly giving up on all the backstop things that they've pushed for. But, you know, one needs to be careful not to predict too far in advance. Does, and this is a bit of a quiz question, does GAT 24 paragraph 5B type agreement mean anything to you? <laughs> it... it <laughs> So under the WTO rules, you have to treat everyone the same unless you have an economic agreement with someone. OK, so if you have an e a holistic economic agreement with someone, I can treat you preferentially. Otherwise, if you just come into trade with me as a stranger, I have to treat you the same as I would treat Russia or I would treat uh, South Sudan. I can't give you preferential treatment. And if I give you preferential treatment, I have to then give mm -hmm. Russia and South Sudan two countries that we definitely don't have trading arrangements with. Um, however, uh, getting that kind of agreement usually takes a, a very long time. That subparagraph talks about transition and temporary agreements while you're negotiating. But the temporary agreements themselves usually take three to five years to negotiate when you're negotiating a very big package of, say, the Canada deal that took almost 10 years to negotiate. So I think that he is... Lots of people do this. They'll read a piece of law and they take out a clause mm -hmm. and they say, aha, this is the way we solve everything. And without putting it in context and understand how that clause has been used previously, it kind of, um, it seems to be a panacea, but actually it offers no solutions. Do you think it's, this is how we solve everything? Or is it more, I'm going to throw this thing in to throw you off because nobody understands what on earth I'm going on about? Yes. Apart from Lord he Boston doesn't, Williams, he doesn't <laughs> no, he doesn't understand what is going on about yeah. either. What's happened is someone has told him this is a really good tidbit, and right. someone in his team yeah. might have read this. Someone Brexiteer said this is a really good way. If you remember, during the Brexit campaign, some people were quoting the Vienna Convention on how citizens' rights would be preserved. Now it's bullshit because it was a lack of understanding of how the Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Relations works doesn't affect normal citizens but people still would throw that around and say mm -hmm. well the Vienna Convention will mean that all citizens are protected well, we've seen now that citizens aren't protected they're having to fill in mm -hmm. these additional forms to ensure that that protection then happens so that's what this is a case of and whether it's deliberate that he's doing it and he knows or whether he's just thick as two short planks mm -hmm. but has been told this line I can't determine my gut feeling is that he's cleverer than he take, puts on yeah, I imagine so. I, also, it doesn't really matter, does it? I mean, my prediction, I'll put out my prediction, see if you think it's plausible, uh, is he will essentially, by the 31st of October, he seems to me quite confident he can leave the European Union by the 31st of October. That's the one thing that's quite consistent in what he's saying. I think he'll basically pass the withdrawal agreement um, before then. So you've seen people like Stephen Kinnock, uh, so a Labour MP, was on 
who, who so far has not voted for Theresa May's deal, was on Politics Live on Monday, and he said that if the withdrawal agreement was brought back this time round, he would vote for it. Um, Caroline Flint voted for it before anyway, but she was on Mars suggesting that there were a bunch, uh, a significant number of Labour MPs who would do. And with Boris in charge, I can imagine him cajoling a few more of the ERG to vote through the withdrawal agreement. And all he'd need is, is the most cosmetic of changes to try and pretend that that something has changed and that it's not actually a, a catastrophic he climb needs, down. He needs an attorney general that will tell him what he needs to say. So our current attorney general is, whilst he is um, a right-wing conservative, he also gets far more money from actually giving decent legal advice to British territories. He earns almost five hundred thousand pounds a year from his oh, wow. advice and support. This is private. Is that work Jeffrey that he, Cox? Yeah, private works that he does for for these people. He supports all their tax avoidance schemes and everything. Wow. He develops them. He knows that if he stood up in Parliament and gave dodgy advice, his actual lucrative work would be dead. And so whilst he wanted to help Theresa, he couldn't give her shit advice. He couldn't give her public mm. advice that was just a legal lie. However, if Boris appoints another Attorney General that doesn't have that same strings attached, you might find someone who's willing to stand up and say, we've got mm -hmm. a cosmetic change. This means the backstop doesn't come into effect. The different, that what then will be, and it will be a very fine balance, I think Labour could lose up to 30 members of Parliament. We've already lost about 15 in that, already in, in votes in terms of abstentions and votes for. 30 isn't, isn't a killer, but we're only gaining about, at the moment, 20 uh, Conservatives over the other side, on the, on the, on the Remain wing, you know, mm -hmm. the Dominic Greaves. So you would have to have another 30 to kind of balance them out, probably another 40. And the calculations that we do on things like a second referendum or stopping no deal, that calculation, if we're talking about it seriously, we're talking about needing 50 Conservatives to come over to us on the more Remainy side of the Conservative Party and expect to lose 30 of ours. Now, hopefully we limit the damage of ours of going over there, and we. but that's the worst case scenario of the only way you can balance it out. And at the moment, we've not got those numbers for anything, let alone stopping Brexit, you've not even got that for stopping no deal. Mm. So does that mean, given that that's the case, does that mean, so we saw today, it seems that there was a shadow cabinet row where Jeremy Corbyn was uh, resistant to moving towards the next phase of calling for a second referendum. John McDonnell, I mean, the way it was reported, it seemed like John McDonnell, Diana, but Keir Starmer, everyone was saying, let's hurry up and back a second referendum. And Jeremy Corbyn was was somewhat more tentative about it and pushed back alongside Angela Rader and Rebecca Long Bailey. Is all of this a complete sideshow because none of it's ever going to happen anyway and we're probably just going to leave by the 31st of October? However, I don't think we will leave by the 31st of October because I think that the wheels of the Johnson campaign, Johnson premiership are likely to come off. What you might see is some Conservatives calling votes for no confidence and where I don't think you will get the Kinnocks going and giving him confidence you might see that the the place gets brought down. And I don't necessarily think the Kinnicks will vote for no deal either. So th th there's a way, there is a pathway through this. However, I think the arguments in the Shadow Cabinet, I think we have got to a stage where Labour is supporting a second referendum on any deal, a confirmatory vote, whatever you want to call it, because there's no deal that can meet Labour's six tests entirely. Mm. We now see that. And so it's not about rejecting and reversing the referendum. It's about saying, we said that we'd only implement it according to the success. That's not possible now, so anything needs to go back to you. And probably that Labour will come either completely fully or mostly on the side of Remain. I think that's already decided. What we're now talking about is how we communicate that, at what timings we do that, how we sell that. And to some extent, I'm happy for that argument to trundle along. I'm on the in the reports, the John McDonnell and the Diane Abbott side, I think we need to get it out there quickly so people build trust with us. But I actually also think that we shouldn't be just uh, um, obsessing over this internal fight at the moment because when the time comes, we will get there. If an election is called, we will have the right wording in the manifesto from my side of thinking. And when, the, when, when and if the moment comes, like Jeremy has already twice, three times now, Whipped, whipped for a second vote and whipped to effectively kind of put it back to the people. He will do that again. So policy-wise, I think that the argument is overblown to try and damage the project. Presentation-wise, I think that we have got a problem, but that 
argument to some extent is not the flagship argument that we're at at the moment. Shelley, by Labour Party conference, it seems pretty likely that Labour will have forced on them, potentially by the membership, a policy of backing a second referendum and backing Remain. Are we just wasting time? Should we just come out right now, right here, right now, and say that's what we're doing and stop? Oof, get the credit for it. Get the credit for it instead of making it look like we were reluctantly forced into that position. I think it's, it's very difficult, isn't it? I mean, obviously you want to be able to take a mandate from the membership. I also think there's a risk of looking cynical um, either way. Um, my biggest concern is the threat of no deal. I do think we, we do have a, a huge problem that we could end up hurtling towards one. And I, I, it's interesting what you say about the wheels coming off the, the Johnson leadership, Lloyd. I don't know whether you mean that they'll have to do a fresh leadership election or... Well, I, I don't know. Chris Bryant was extolling the virtues of how this worked in the tea room the other uh, earlier on today <laughs> tea room gossip very nice yeah uh, chris bryant is kind of seen as the the constitutional geek he knows how it all works right. um so there's something around if a vote of confidence happens early then the conservatives have to nominate another leader they don't necessarily need the, the prime minister doesn't have to be the leader of the party mm-hmm. it just has to be nominated and have confidence by the biggest party and then Parliament overall and you might well find that Boris struggles to get the confidence of the House but there is someone else put up that could wow, okay. that wouldn't then hurtle us to no deal I don't know we're in such bizarre and weird times mm. that anything could happen but equally nothing could happen yeah and if you're looking if you're thinking about the example you gave of Worthing where the parties are trying to pick up those Brexit party votes yeah. of course the Tory membership is thinking well Boris is the only body, only person that can save us in that regard and no deal is potentially the only thing that's going to win us back those those voters so you know i think it's a real risk but it sounds like um, a lot could happen be- but before and the from end of the October. labor party yeah because we'll never endorse no deal mm-hmm. the only area where we can try and then steal a trump over the conservatives and the brexit party in that worthing seat for example is that relatively significant liberal and green vote those voters, where yeah. we can try and persuade them so that's where the messaging is important because i don't think anyone doubts the end point but it's about do those Liberal and Greens feel like we're on their side or do we feel like we've reluctantly kind of been forced into that position and they shouldn't believe us? It's a trust issue. It's a trust, trust with issues. Boris Johnson. It's a trust with the Labour Party and, and we need to make sure we're on the right side of it. Yeah. I, I think the, the, the biggest reason we won't have a vote of no confidence in Boris Johnson is because as far as I can remember, he's never actually done anything difficult in his life. <laughs> so so I think he talks tough, but ultimately he'll take the path of least resistance at the point mm. at which he becomes prime minister. And the path of least mm. resistance is not no deal. The path of least resistance is not to risk a vote of no confidence. So I actually don't see him being a politician or a prime minister that deals with in brinkmanship particularly. I think he's going to bullshit when he talks and then do the easiest thing when he's actually in power. There, there is a rumour that he has done a deal with some people that says that he will effectively drive us to a referendum that is no deal versus remain, that he can keep a lot of the ERGers on side with some of that and he can keep some of his remainers on side of that. It allows him to then be the populist out in the public um, to back no deal and get the public mandate of this automatism and it allows Parliament and the remainers to feel like we've had one more shot of it. Mm. And that rumour has come from relatively senior people I've heard oh wow from. would you risk that would you be up for risking no deal versus remain um i think that the only options on the ballot paper should be legally workable options there is a legally workable no deal but at the moment when people talk about no deal it's about five different options yeah that could be worked out so you've got to spell it out so if boris spelled it out my view is that you have this confirmation vote brown envelopes on the table of the civil servant the the minute the result comes out from the uh, from the from the returning officers, mm-hmm. the civil servant just sends the relevant brown envelope to Brussels, mm. and that's our solution. So there's and no more Parliament gets to be no, passed, you know, yeah. and Parliament gets no more decision of it. So, so if no deal was spelt out, then I think I, okay, bring it on. If it's not spelt out and it's vacuous, then it's just a rerun of the last one, and that is completely useless. That's the same as mess we're in at the moment. So we're going to move away from Brexit and yes, Boris because, as I know, I want to take advantage of your your foreign policy expertise. Before we move on to that, uh, you're watching Tisky Sour. This is Navarra Media. As you know, Tisky Sour and Navarra Media is only possible because of your kind support. If you are already a subscriber, thank you very much. You're what makes this possible. If you aren't, please go to support.navarramedia.com and you know our ask is for the equivalent of one hour's wage 
a month. Uh, as ever, please like this video. It means that more people see it. Please share it on Twitter. Please share it on Facebook and keep your comments coming. We love them. I'll move to your questions a little bit later in the show. So for now, uh, Saudi arms sales is what we're going to talk about. Um, there was a court decision last week uh, that <coughs> the government had behaved unlawfully uh, in giving uh, permission to or, or in sort of signing the contracts or signing the licenses for British arms dealers to sell uh, weapons to, to Saudi Arabia to uh, use in their, in their war against Yemen. The judge declared that uh, the government had not, take, had not made any attempt, in fact, actually, to try to um, make sure that these weapons would not be used uh, to break international law. Lloyd, I know you were in the courtroom, mm -hmm. uh, so can you give us some details of that case? Well. The um, judges overturned a previous decision of the High Court where the High Court said that the government hadn't erred. So arms are only allowed to be licensed um, according to EU rules that are enshrined in domestic law. So we're talking about EU law and domestic law here. Um, and this case is even more complicated because technically it is the government themselves that are buying the weapons and then giving them to the Saudis. So the British government buys them, gives them to the Saudis, and so BAE Systems kind of exports them to the MOD. So it's a very complicated oh. string of kind of how this works. Well, and the Saudis pay the MOD? Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, they pay it back in a slightly different way because you pay some of it via a credit export guarantee, so some of it's paid back over a, kind of like a... Um, well, like 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 many people buy sofas and TVs in their houses on a, mm. on a credit arrangement. Um, the ruling said, not that the licenses were illegal, mm. not that, that there was um, any criminality in that, or making a judgment about whether the weapons had been used for illegal purposes or not. I think that they probably are used, and they're breaking international law. But what it said very specifically is the government had failed to make any assessment of whether international humanitarian law crimes were or had, more importantly, had taken place. It is illegal, you are not meant to authorise uh, um, weapons sales if there is a danger, a real risk, that they could be used for international humanitarian law crimes. Well, the best way of predicting future behaviour surely is to look at someone's past behaviour. You know, if you've got kind of if there's a paedophile that's been arrested and convicted for paedophilia you probably don't allow them to work in a school because even they might be the most reformed character you probably say you've got a track record in here you probably don't trust you it's a similar kind of thinking but the court was actually on, on paragraph 141 of the judgment it's even more indicting the court says in early 2016 there was an active decision to stop looking at international humanitarian law crimes that had taken place. In late 2016, the government removed that part of the pro forma that even did the tick box check mm -hmm. process. But the government refused to provide any chain of who had made that decision. So we're unwise of where and what level that decision had been made. What we also know at the same time with the court documents that have come out, the head, the independent head of the joint unit said to the minister, his gut feeling was that we should reject these arms sales. And so somewhere between him and the minister, this decision was changed. It was sent back down to the unit and the joint unit rewrote the applications so that they were to be approved. Deliberately, maybe, or not deliberately, not checking IHL. And it might well have been that change in 2016 that allowed them to approve them, because if they had done previous practices, the gut would have been one way, mm -hmm. as, as, the, as the head of the unit said. But the other way, they were able to approve them. So what is now going to happen is a 10-week review of all the licences that have taken place. Now... You might, and no new licenses can be approved. Now, a lot of people will be going, oh, no new licenses can be approved, fantastic. The problem is, most of the licenses are what are called open licenses. So these are indefinitely open licenses which you can ship as much goods as you like in those classes of weapons 
to any amount um, to the particular recipient and those open licenses will remain and will remain being used during this period of a 10 week review the minister told me privately i probably shouldn't say this but um tough luck he said to me um after 10 weeks we expect it all to be back to normal anyway wow. so my view is is this a genuine 10 week review it looks unlikely and at the same time the government is going to appeal this in the supreme court and try and uh, strike down the judgment now we've got the judgment on our side but it's effectively won all we lost the high court mm -hmm. we've won the supreme court and do you know what matters? It matters what judges you got. Mm. In the High Court, the, preside, the, the chief presiding judge was someone who had spent almost all their career representing the MOD. The chief presiding judge at the Court of Appeal, or the three judges, sorry, at the Court of Appeal, were people who had come from an international law background and a human rights background. So who you get in the Supreme Court, and it's unlikely that it will be heard by all the judges. Some cases are heard by all, but that's unlikely. Will make a real difference to the outcome of this judgment. Um, sometimes we don't look enough at the the background of certain judiciary that are looking at certain mm. kinds of cases. In America they're very used to it because they're political appointees, mm -hmm. but in the UK we kind of think that they're neutral. The reality is that they're not quite. Wow. If, if Labour get into government, will this all change? Yes, we're going to ban arms sales to mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia. We're going to ban arms sales to Israel. Um, we'll then conduct a review on how this happens. I, I think we have got to a stage where I've persuaded our front bench that we would move to an independent uh, assessment of arms. Just like, I mean, with me, broadcast, me, broadcast media, you have Ofcom. Mm -hmm. You don't have the minister. With the Monopolies Commission, you have, a, you have a commission that does this, not the minister. The minister can overrule these bodies if need be, but they then have to do that in open parliament. And the problem is at the moment is that civil servants self-censor because they are in the department. And these private notes, this gut feeling, wasn't an official recommendation. We only know about it because the person was on oath in the stand and said, yes, I wrote a pro private note that said this. You suddenly take it out of government, put it into an independent commission, and then you allow them to publish their re results publicly mm. and if the minister wants to overturn it say if they say we still want to approve we you could approve weapons to Saudi Arabia the minister could still then decide to overrule that and say the Labour minister could say well because of political reasons even though it fulfills the criteria we're not going to sell but it makes it almost impossible to reverse it the other way you can't mm. have a commission mm. saying oh don't sell and the minister reversing it so that would be a really big change some activists say to me well why would we sell any weapons under a Labour government and that's because what we talk about as weapons are a large diverse set of things so um, air traffic control units clearly can be used to control fighter planes but also can be used to control civil aviation you probably want to encourage well maybe you don't encourage civil aviation for other reasons but you want to encourage safe flying chlorine is used for the purification of water but it's also used in creating very dangerous chemical weapons so you need still in non kind of bombs to have some regulation of weapons. My view is, the bigger view, and this is Unite have put forward some motions for this at the TUC, is we need to fundamentally change our economic basis so that we don't rely on these big ticket items of bombs to Saudi Arabia. And we're actually building wind farms that generate energy. We can be a world leader in some of that if we made the big shift. And loads of people say, what about jobs? But let's put this in context. The arms industry in Britain employs almost the same number of people to the to the nearest thousand as the plastics industry. It produces the same amount of GDP for this country as the plastics industry. When we're talking about getting rid of single-use plastic straws and plastic bags, nobody says, oh, what about the jobs? Because we understand the top people in the plastics industry have got good chemical engineering backgrounds and they'll find good other jobs. And the people who are working on the factory line mm -hmm. will find other factory lines to work on. And yes, we'll have to transition. Yes, we'll have to try and support people in the plastics industry to go into, I don't know, the paper industry or whatever, the, the alternative would be just like we would have to in a Labour government do that for arms but if we can do it in plastics and other areas it is uh, it is I think uh, dangerous to say that we can't do it in other areas it lacks ambition 
but more fundamentally there is something about the macho nature of the arms industry there is something i think in british mentality that we need to change and transform and this is why our peace education program of labor is really important to transform the idea that building bombs is somehow a more prestigious job than looking after someone in a nursing home mm. and actually what we need to do is change people's attitudes to work particularly around how it's genderized still today but also in terms of how there's this kind of hierarchy of what's good and what's bad which don't reflect social good or, or, or actually what we want to encourage in this world. Shelley you're on the committee of Stop the War right? So yes. Stop the War's I suppose an interesting organisation or, or I suppose it tells an interesting story which is that so many people who are you know on the Labour left, Labour members, they'll see at times that the trade unions behave in a way to potentially protect the arms industry so with regard Trident for example some of the trade unions were, were quite anti uh, the idea of, of, of not renewing it but at the same time the trade unions have been incredibly instrumental and a leading force in these campaigns against uh, fighting foreign wars against, against wars Absolutely. so so I mean how do you read the position of the trade unions here are they, are they pro building weapons but not using them or, or, or what's going on there basically well obviously the trade unions initial response is always to protect jobs it's not about protecting bombs or the use of them um, I mean it's not there's no simple answer the trade unions have like a wide set of policies they all you know represent different people in different factories and no one union has the same policy on this but in terms of what Lloyd was talking about that that process of transition I understand something like the decommissioning process of Trident in itself will take 25 years of which obviously you'd need those skilled workers to undertake that you know that task um, and I think the transition thing is something we, we need to talk more and more about but also there's a there's a fantastic history of, of union members um, taking part in resistance you know um, for example the Chilean airplanes and um, you know there's, there's things that you know unions um, can be talking more about there as well and I think the Green New Deal in particular has to be part of this this conversation of how do those jobs um, how do we utilize those workers to take on those those future jobs um, but just going back to what you're saying Lloyd about the the kind of Ofcom comparison it's absolutely incredible the fact that, that those checks and balances exist for one industry but in the meantime the consequence of not having checks and balances on something like this is the deaths of hundreds of thousands of mm. Yemenis um, and, and, and also I think like, it's easy to have conversations about arms sales and stuff without talking about the actual human yeah. or humanitarian um, like result of it um, so that's yeah I think that's also like an important part of the conversation. Um, the, the, the government um, stopped three sets of arms sales to Saudi Arabia last year of Warsaw Pact weapons mm -hmm. because um, Warsaw Pact weapons, so there were two main weapons bases in the world in terms of ammunition, that's what I'm talking about. Warsaw Pact, old former USSR, mm. and NATO Pact. Now it's not as simple as that, some of it's interchangeable, but broadly. Oh, and so the bullet, all the all the items sort of fit together, yeah, so yeah. either you're equipped with Warsaw Pact weapons exactly. or you're equipped with Saudi, NATO. Saudi Arabia is equipped with NATO. Yeah. So why would you need for 30 million rounds, which is more than was used in the whole of the Iraq war? Um, why would you need to order that, um, the third order in three years? Um, well, you have to sign a document that says we will not divert this to other groups, bearing in mind Al-Qaeda, a Saudi's kind of affiliate in the Yemen. And they do use Warsaw Pact weapons. Um, and so the British government refused that licence after 18 months of prevaricating and the shipment still went and it got in their hands. But let's forget about that scandal for a bit let's roll back they refused it because they said they didn't believe the certificate that the Saudis had written because it was in uncredible well clearly it's uncredible to say you're going to use 30 million rounds of uh, ammunition of weapons that you don't hold so why then does the British government on the bombs case trust the Saudis because the well, they haven't looked at their past behaviour. We know that because the court case said that they were dodgy. Uh, they, they hadn't looked at that, and that's why the, the, the decision was dodgy. And we know that um, uh, that going forward that there are problems. So the only thing that the government is taking into account is this certificate that the Saudis provide, and it says, we promise to not commit international humanitarian oh, law right. crimes. That's the only bit of evidence that they've got. And they've rejected it with other shipments, from Saudi Arabia, they've effectively said Saudi Arabia is an unreliable partner in other areas. So why suddenly in this area is it reliable? And finally, I just wanted to say about the the, 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 the kind of diversification. Mm. This is a very long running contract that we have with Saudi Arabia. The final stages of the contract 
require us to move productive capacity to Saudi Arabia. What that means, in layman's terms, is we have committed to moving the factories and the tooling over to Saudi Arabia. So at the end, they will build their own weapons and bombs and all of our boys and girls, men and women, will be out of jobs anyway. We have signed the contract that already sells the death knell for many of our trade union comrades. And so that's why I think some trade unions are starting to come around to this now, that we need to take some quite immediate action on things like the Green New Deal, on that transition process, because they realise that it's a, it's a dying trade, because we've signed our own jobs away. Hmm. All right, we're going to go to questions in a moment. So start asking your questions. I'm going to collect those. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, I'm going to just bring up Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm not really an expert on <coughs> this, but I mean, it, 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 it seems that now there's the potential that the United States are heading to war with, with Iran. Jeremy Hunt uh, said yesterday that the United Kingdom would have to make a decision on a case-by-case -case basis as to whether we would uh, join in in any potential uh, attack on on Iran, um, let's, let's, I'll, I'll just do the sort of like he was also the period that's led up to wasn't this. He for being more sceptical about yeah. obviously joining in the war was kind of um, goading him on Twitter when of course you know you only have to look at the devastation in Iraq, the civil war in Libya to know that Corbyn has been absolutely right on these issues for years and presumably knows a lot, a lot more than Jeremy Hunt on <laughs> any foreign policy. I'm not sure question. Jeremy Hunt knows that much about these things. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, so the build-up, I'll, I'll go through some of the build-up. So last week, Iran downed an American surveillance drone. Iran said it was in their airspace. Mm -hmm. The US claimed it was in international airspace. It was about a half a mile between which side it was on. Yeah, well, it's also, if you could, it's just, why are they flying a, a surveillance drone that close to their airspace? Bit, bit much, anyway. But in response, the US almost launched an airstrike on Iran, but Trump called them off 10 minutes before <coughs> they were due to launch. Trump obviously tweeted that this was because he cared about protecting life. Uh, a senior operative in the administration, in the Trump administration, uh, briefed anonymously that actually it was because they thought that their drone, their surveillance drone, was probably actually in Iranian um, airspace. Um, and this all followed... Uh, the sinking of two oil tankers in the Strait of Hormuz on the 12th of June, uh, again, for which the US has blamed Iran. That was what you were talking about there. So Jeremy Hunt was saying, yes, we, yes. we, we should hurry up and blame Iran. I think most of the European leaders said we don't actually have enough evidence yet. Jeremy Corbyn also said, let's be sure that we have enough evidence before mm. we, we, we cast blame in this way. Um, I don't know if any of you have, if you, you have insight into whether we're going to war in Iran. Um, but I mean, you've got a... Stop the war are hosting a, a meeting. It's a demonstration tomorrow, tomorrow. Oh, a demonstration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At 5 p.m., I think, the start time, um, Downing Street. So, I mean, if people are around and in London, please come along. I think in answer to your question of are we going to war with Iran, it, it's very hard to know, but I think it's, de it's definitely a possibility. I think with the way that Donald Trump's been talking in the last few days, um, we're well, not even just talking, the way that he literally lined up warplanes um, ready, to, ready to attack, and then at the last minute it was like, actually, no. Um, it's, it, I mean, it, on the one hand, it could be quite similar to the way that he's dealt with North Korea. On one hand, calling, you know, saying that he's going to go to war and whatever, and then the next minute having a, a photo press conference. Um, I, I, don't, I just don't know. I'm, I'm actually quite scared about the prospect of what could happen, mm. um, what he could do or say next. Um, but I'm also quite scared of it, whoever becomes the next prime minister, um, how quickly they will kind of join in with that. Um, so I think it's on all of us, it's on activists to kind of get involved in the movement to try and stop whatever whatever aggression could take place. Part of the difficulty is our relationship with NATO here um, and the role that we have traditionally played with NATO where we've been an uncritical friend mm -hmm. of the US. I mean, at least France has at times withdrawn from NATO command and you know, refused to go to war. The, the, the last, of course, government that did that was the Labour government under Wilson. Um, and since then, we have been basically a puppet. And if you have a blonde bimbo one side of the Atlantic and a blonde bimbo mm -hmm. this side of the Atlantic, um, there is a real fear that we will end up going into something that is very undesirable. And one of the th actual things that I would give some credit to this government, and actually it's not been led by this government, it's been led by our European partners, but we've followed Europe on this rather than America, is the treatment of the Iran deal. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And America has been very angry that Britain particularly, but some other key European countries, didn't follow them in demonising Iran. Iran followed the deal agreements. We wanted to open up Iran because the best way of stopping countries going to war with each other is to open them up and interlink them, allow their people to exchange, allow their economies to network. I, mean, I always say this about the blockade on Cuba. If Americans really wanted to influence Cuba in a direction that they'd want, they'd have opened it up and they'd... It's bizarre American policies of trying to shut people off and they think it will make it people more like them. It's complete opposite. Mm. And and Trump, I think, is very angry that the European countries didn't follow suit and shut off Iran. And so now he is in a process of having to try and demonise Iran enough so that the European countries are forced to have to follow suit and implement economic sanctions and other sanctions into Iran. And the danger is that Britain will be the first one out of that stable. Already our relationship with Europe is much less than the other countries, but also our relationship with America is much more sub, uh, sub, you know, submissive. You know, kind of, um, they say jump and we say how high. Um, <laughs> you know, they say suck and we say how much. Um, bomb how you know, kind of, exactly you know so it's it's that's our relationship it's very dangerous but my feeling is that there is an underlying motive here of Trump trying to demonize Iran because the other countries in that deal were unwilling to go along with it now you might be right it might just be Trump banging his drum but the problem is I can't tell you whether that's true or not the Iranians, for sure, have no idea whether that's true or not. Mm. And in international relations, in a rules-based order, where you have the UN, where you have other processes that are meant to slow down escalation, what is key is some sort of predictability. If I do this, you'll do that. If you have someone that's breaking that predictability, there is a real danger that then you, Iran or other actors, start to say, well, if they're not going to be predictable we don't also need to be predictable as well. And so mm. it creates this edging up of hostility, which then, of course, is a self-fulfilling prophecy because it allows Trump to say, aha, I told you so, mm. and then go in there and strike. So there is a very dangerous pattern. That's but I think that's what the strategy is designed to do. You know, you yeah. said the strategy of cutting them off and the most recent sanctions on oil, I think yeah. that is exactly what it is about. So I don't think, in that sense, it is actually quite logical. Um, I mean, the economy is in absolute turmoil. What else have they got to lose? Um, but uh, yeah, but I also think the other the other thing that's at risk is is how how much U.S. allies and indeed U.K. allies want the war to happen. Um, in particular, Saudi Arabia, Israel yeah. um, are more up for it than than Trump. Well, it, totally, and and this is you go back to the Yemen issue here. People constantly say this is a proxy war between yeah. Saudi Arabia and Iran. Iran is involved now in the Yemen, but Saudi Arabia was involved about five years prior mm. to Iran ever getting involved in this um, uh, more dispute, directly. and very much directly. And so there is an element of also some of these countries deliberately trying to pull Iran into things mm. so that they can then make excuses to totally, yeah. obliterate. And to tell you the truth, Iranian ideology is not particularly my cup of tea, but Saudi ideology is to some extent, just as bad, if not worse, in many respects. So, you know, the Wahhabism versus mm. the... You know, oh, it takes the, hypocrisy that, when people bring that uh, in as a reason. Absolutely ridiculous. And I've had people kind of ringing up this week because of um, some arguments about who I was There's a question about in, that, actually. In discussions. So, so you were... People <laughs> screaming down the phone, people mm-hmm. saying they hope bricks will fall on top of me, that I'll be dead tomorrow, because how dare I support Iranian-backed Houthis, all this kind of... Absolutely hysterical stuff. But and people saying, oh, they're anti Semites and they're homophobes. And I wanted to say, yeah, but what about the Saudi Arabians? They're hardly they're hardly a symbol of liberal, you know, kind of Yeah, and values. that'll leave your colleagues in Parliament are cozying up to the Saudis. Ex- quite a few. Exactly. <laughs> in the party, in Ma- fact. They're, they're all they all see you next Tuesdays in yeah. many respects. Let's bring up we can bring ideology. up one of them, Graham Graham Jones, chair of the Committee for Arms Exports Twitch Controls. Is. So he's I think a, you had another word that rhymed with twit, didn't you? <laughs> he's a big supporter of arming the Saudis and accuses his critics. I, I assume he's he's including you in here, as I quote, far left Marxists who back a violent racist Islamic fascist militia. 
Wow. Uh, when it comes to Yemen. Is that momentum? <laughs> yes, this is the man, of course, who has um, been on a number of paid trips to the UAE. He tried to persuade me to go on one of them earlier on in the year, um, where you then have your eyes opened to the truth and justice that the UAE and Saudi Arabia-led coalition are doing. Um, and, of course, is a man who's where some of the bombs are made in his constituency. So he has a kind of skewed, I think, mm. view on this. Um, I don't think it's fair to say that the Secretary General of the UN, that, you know, kind of uh, the, you know, many people, uh, many countries, um, that most aid organisations from Oxfam to, you know, kind of uh, Doctors Beyond Borders, I don't think you could say that they are all just loony Marxists. They are people that are saying what has been caused there is the biggest famine in modern history. In over 100 years, 30 million people on the brink of hunger. What they're saying is that the bombing raids are completely, not indiscriminate, but they are targeting civilians. And we know that because of the double-dip method that mm -hmm. the Saudis do, where they go and bomb you wait five, ten minutes for the ambulances all to come in to pick up the people who are... And then you go and bomb deliberately again where you bomb medics who are mm. helping people who are dying. You only do that in the most brutal and nasty way. And the reality is Graham Jones is an apologist for that. I saw him in the lobby today. He said, oh, we've had a bit of a ding-dong on Twitter. And I said, yes, I think you're totally wrong in what you're saying. I said, but I'll give as good as I can get, Graham. And what I'll give to him is that he is an apologist for people who not only we now know that the government have turned a blind eye to in terms of international humanitarian law, his committee that he chairs is meant to inspect the government and hold them to account and he's totally failed because he's an apologist. He won't even allow Yemeni experts to come and speak to the international, to, to the um, committee on arms control. He is in the pocket of one of the, um, uh, the coalition partners the UAE and I don't say that in a libelous way I say that in look at his register of interest he's had a number of trips there with them and I'm afraid he has completely lost any perspective on human life I don't want to cozy up to Iran or the Houthis I think they're vile some of their ideologies are absolutely vile not their people but some of their ideologies are absolutely vile but my god if you, you can't criticize our ally the first role of a British citizen is to criticise our government. The second role of a British citizen is to criticise our government's allies. Our government is already busy criticising our government's enemies. I don't need to add my voice to criticism to Russia because the government's doing a fine enough job for me on that behalf if I don't like Russia or if I don't like Iran. They're doing that. My job is to hold truth to power and that is our cosy up relationship with Saudi Arabia. And if you have politicians and MPs that just want to continue that cosy up relationship, they're failing in their fundamental duty to hold the executive to account and they should consider their positions. Interesting. Uh, I think, Graham Jones, if you want to come on and have a one-on-one -on -one debate with Lloyd Russell Moyle, I think that would make a good tisky sour. So if you are watching, uh, get in touch. Uh, I think that could be fiery. Uh, we've got a lot of questions, so I quite like to do this as, as quick fire, right? So... I am going to direct questions to how each do you of relax? you. Um, <laughs> I'll start with that, Shelley. How do you relax? Oh, I I like to work out actually. <laughs> so that's a much more norm, that's a much more normal and better. I suppose it would have been it wouldn't have been that plausible if Boris had come out with that one. Uh, this is the real question for you. So this is from Pretzel. Uh, thoughts on Tories losing their majority once Boris Johnson becomes leader, either through by elections or the threatened defections. I'm always hopeful Labour's going to win the next general election, no matter who the Tory leader is. But before that, so before sort of like that. MPs leaving, by elections. Oh right! Oh, I see what you mean. Quick fight? Yes no, or no? No, no. Of not, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tories don't Hold defect. The line. Tories like that. They they like to stay in power, don't they? Uh, I don't. I don't know if I even understand that question. Oh, so there's going to be a bunch of by elections. Well, there's only going to be one by election, and the Tories could lose it, and then the Tories could go down to a majority of only three. Um, yeah. Right, right. And you, then potentially, you. I mean, we could imagine that there'd be some MPs, some Tory MPs who might vote uh, no confidence in the leader right, right. or even defect, um, which is. So that's what Lloyd was saying earlier. Yeah, it's possible, but I think it's unlikely because Tory rebels tend to only be Tory rebels in sort of mm. words. 
not so much deeds. Tories are better at discipline than us because Mm. they have money on their side. Mm. You know, if you stand down from being a Labour MP, you return to be a normal citizen, apart from if you're one or two of our warmongering former leaders. Um, And... uh, but the Tories, of course, can say, well, if you step down, old chap, we'll give you a directorship of British Petroleum or you'll have a seat on mm. Covent Garden board and it'll be nice and remunerated. Or you can even be the Anglo Bermuda Friendship Society chair. If you've ever seen the um, uh, episode of Yes, Minister, they go through all of this. Mm. And so, of course, the Tories have a greater level of discipline because they know that if they fuck the party over, sorry for my language, um, that, of course, the party will fuck them over. Mm -hmm. in their future whereas the problem with Labour MPs is they know they can fuck the party over and the party then has nothing over them for the rest of their life after they retire Mm. and so that's why discipline in the Tory party is tight this is a comment not a question but it's very nice James Simpson says thank you Lloyd for being a brilliant representative of the LGBT community in Parliament Uh, very nice we had Roger Godsiff today in the adjournment debate trying to uh, justify why parents were outside um kept protesting in Birmingham he said oh well the parents weren't properly consulted I've got no idea what consultation is about do you want us to treat about a uh, teach about equality yes or no all the parents put their hands up and say no and the government guidelines is still you have to go ahead and teach it so it's just fake consultation you might as well not bother but anyway he was trying to justify it and I was very pleased with actually a really good showing of Labour MPs that basically said he was wrong yeah so that was quite... He didn't really have anyone on his side there. He had one Labour MP that maybe said maybe the Committee for Religious Education should look over the sexual and relationship education before it Goodness goes me. out. Uh, but uh, I think that he was a lone voice. Uh, Andrew Kular, question for Shelley. Is it worth joining a union if you're on a zero-hour contract? Yes, absolutely, and campaign to not be on one. Mm. But can you use your sort of like your weight as a worker or do you have to basically campaign separately to not be on one? You can go on strike as a zero hour worker, can't you? You Because you don't have much leverage. But if you were contracted to work zero hours that week, it might not be very effective. But (laughs) yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, you can. And uh, check out the TUC's website to find out which union is best suited to your place of work. Inna, what's Lloyd's opinion on NATO membership? Wouldn't it be better to rely on the European Union for our defensive needs? Um... My view is that currently as we stand, we probably need to remain NATO members and work to reform it and change it from within. My view would be that I would like to build up a democratic um, kind of led pan-European army. Some have criticised that, saying it would just be a puppet of NATO. And so this is the problem. If you just jump out of the frying pan into the fire, you could end up with something worse. My view is that we could build something more positive. Jeremy has a well-recorded view on the other side of this but I don't think it is clear-cut but I think where Jeremy and I do agree is we're very sceptical about that relationship with NATO and the need for something to come after how we built that after is I think open for discussion and I'm quite open for that Jeremy's quite open for it even though we start from a slightly different position and I think that's where the Labour Party should be remain NATO members at the moment look at reforming NATO, but actually look at building something different in the future that means that we could at least downgrade our membership, like the French have in the past, where they've removed themselves from NATO command. Shelley, NATO membership? Oh, I think Jeremy and Lloyd are both correct in being very sceptical of that. Yes, I would check out the Young Labour policy on NATO membership. What is Young Labour's policy on NATO membership? Get out. Get out, really? Yeah. Wow. (laughs) Uh, Okay, this is final question. I like this one. Um, Daniel Eden asks, would Corbyn's Labour sell weapons to left-wing groups like the Kurdish YPG? If not, should they? So I suppose that links back to your, your argument there that we, we should still do arms exports because they can have civilian purposes. This is the question <coughs> about is, should pacifism, as it were, sort of inform our, our policy of arms sales? Or should we uh, be, in a targeted way, exporting arms to precisely those uh, countries and movements which we think are fighting a just cause, potentially a defensive one? Um, I'm the all-party chair for Rojava, the Kurds in Syria, of which the YPG is their army. I'm the only MP to have visited the YPG and YPJ units active on the ground, and I will be returning back this year. I'm very supportive of them, and there is a role of us uh, supporting and equipping them at certain times. However, I would still be sceptical of just flooding 
areas anywhere in the world of particularly small ammunition that can't be traced. The Germans have just started a process where even to allies they serial code every single item and a German inspector then goes to that country and inspects it every few years to make sure all those weapons are still left in that country. Mm. And if the country diverts everything, and literally, the, I spoke to the German inspector, he goes and insists that every single version of that gun is in the room at that moment, and they just can't, if they're anywhere else in the world, they have to be shipped back. And if they're not all in that room and they require 100% compliance, they ban that country from the list of arms exporters. So... Yes, we probably do want to, but we would need to incorporate some of the safeguards that other mm. countries have to stop them being diverted. Because the very worst thing at the end of a civil war is that every Tom, Dick and Harry has a Kalashnikov in their backyard and it means that war is so much easier to then spark off again. So we need to be careful about unintended consequences. Yeah, and during a civil war when there are so many different parties at yeah. war... And that that level of kind of scrutiny also involves a high level of intervention, not just yeah. weapon sales, but actual on the ground monitoring. So I would definitely be sceptical, although it's definitely a cause that we should be very supportive of. Is Stop the War pacifist? That's a very good question. I don't know. Pro-peace, pro anti-war. <laughs> Pro-peace, anti-war, yeah. Um, all right, let's end it there. Thank you both so much for joining me this evening. We covered a lot. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how much Boris Johnson's pathological lying uh, is an effective electoral strategy. Obviously, he's never gone out to the whole country before, and that'll be interesting to see. Uh, if you're in London, where is your where is your meeting tomorrow? It's a protest, and it's outside Sorry, Downing Street, 5pm, uh, no to war in Iran. Fabulous. Uh, there's also lots of questions about whether you'll be Labour leader in the future. Uh, no. No. Uh, I, I I would love to be uh, foreign secretary, John Prescott to, like John Prescott was to Tony Blair. Oh, but to who? Well, maybe to Jeremy, maybe to whoever comes forward. John Prescott was in charge of local government, transport, the environment, climate change, housing, um, uh, national parks, um, and uh, uh, constitutional reform. Oh, interesting. Um, you don't want so, a foreign. You don't want a foreign policy gig. No, I, I, I'm being a bit flippant. I mean, I don't necessarily mean I would want those portfolios. Okay. But I you would, want to run the show. I would love you to. You want to run the show? Okay, yeah. But, but someone else can be the leader. When I was the vice president of the European Youth Forum, or when I was the vice president of the British Youth Council, or the vice president, actually my favourite roles were those vice president roles. Your leader could go out and you could be getting the work done behind mm. the scenes. Good answer. All right. Thank you both. Thank you for watching. Uh, we'll be back time, same place. As ever, uh, you know this show is only possible because of your kind support. If you are already a subscriber, thank you very much. If not, please go to support.navaromedia.com and donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month. Like this video, keep your comments coming, share it on Twitter, share it on Facebook. Uh, see you next week. Good night.